Good morning, everyone. Governor Scott is currently on the Tuesday COVID-19 call with fellow governors and White House officials, but he'll be joining us shortly. I'm Mike Smith, Secretary of the Agency of Human Services, and I'll start off with an update on our progress with the vaccination program, as well as provide more information about summer camp testing uh, after that. And then Sarah Squirrel, Commissioner of the Department of Mental Health, will provide us with information on ongoing mental health impacts, the state's commitment to helping kids, and the value of after school and summer programs and helping them rebuild connections and start healing. Commissioner Pichek will present our weekly modeling followed by Dr. Levine with a health update and then Governor Scott will join us and provide an update from his meeting and offer additional remarks. Last Friday, the governor laid out a challenge to Vermonters. If 80% of eligible, eligible Vermonters those 12 years of age and above are vaccinated with at least one dose before July 4th, he would lift the remaining COVID-19 restrictions that day. Otherwise, the restrictions would remain in place until July 4th and would then be lifted. We reported that according to the CDC, Vermont vaccinated 74.9% of the eligible population and we needed just under 28,000 additional eligible Vermonters to be vaccinated to hit the 80% mark. The CDC numbers of total vaccinated Vermonters over the weekend showed tremendous progress towards that goal. But after a few days with these very high numbers, we questioned whether we had made that much progress. Notably, the CDC reported on Monday that we were at 78.9% of the eligible population having been vaccinated with at least one dose. Although the CDC regularly reconciles data and disregards any duplicate records, we decided to proactively reach out to the CDC to ensure that the accuracy of the CD, to ensure the accuracy of the CDC vaccination numbers. This review in collaboration with the CDC did find duplicate reporting in one batch of veteran affairs numbers uh, numbers reported late last week and in a limited number of independent pharmacies reported from April 6th through May 22nd. We confirmed this late yesterday. We have corrected our reporting and asked the C CDC to remove the duplicates. We have also, also updated our tracking and with these corrections in place, the percentage of eligible Vermonters vaccinated currently stands at 76.9%, with the remaining number of Vermonters needed to be vaccinated at 17,250 to reach the 80% mark. To be clear, the number removed those that had been duplicated, which was about 11,000 Vermonters, and then added in additional vaccination, vaccinations reported and completed since Friday, including yesterday's results of about 4,700. In the future, the Vermont Department of Health will simply remove the veteran affairs numbers when reporting to the CDC because the CDC already has those numbers. And for the three pharmacies going forward, we, we have confirmed that only one of us will count them, not both of us. This will prevent this situation from happening in the future. We've had great success with our vaccination program, but we are being very careful not to overstate our progress. Until the state of Vermont and the CDC reconcile any duplicates in the reporting, we will be reporting our own reconciled numbers on a daily basis using corrected CDC data. Even with this adjustment, even with this adjustment, our goal from Friday has been reduced by approximately 10,000 Vermonters. This is exciting, but there is still much work to do, and we need to continue reaching out to those Vermonters that have not been vaccinated. We need 17,250 more eligible Vermonters to step up and do their part to help us meet the 80% goal. Moving on, our efforts to bring vaccines into the communities where people live, play, and work are paying off. 
Over the weekend at our 30 EMS clinics, many Vermonters reported that they changed their mind and after their initial hesitation, then chose to get vaccinated because it was available and easy for them. In addition, we have been successful at our school-based clinics, through our healthcare providers, through the Vermont National Guard and Health Department clinics, and with our pharmacy partners providing vaccines to, Vermonter, to Vermonters. I'm happy to share that we have several more unique and fun vaccination events planned, including one at Thunder Road on May 30th and at many of our state parks on June 12th. These are walk-in events. We also are bringing, planning to bring vaccinations to mobile home parks across the state and a barnstorming event on Route 22A, including events at Higher Ground in South Burlington and the Jazz Fest in Burlington. I'll announce the details for these events as we finalize the plans. And we continue to reach out to employers to host vaccine clinics at their work site. Again, we are starting with the largest employers first. We are working with 27 businesses across the state to host clinics, including The Edge, National Life, Global Foundries, and Ethan Allen. Included in these efforts are restaurants, hospitality, and tourism workers. And we're planning the next wave for small business. That has already begun. If you are a large employer with 100 or more employees and a portion of your staff still un unvaccinated, or if you have a large event coming up for your customers, please reach out. You can submit a request for consideration at accd.vermont.gov slash event dash types and uh, slash vaccine dash clinics. A lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of there on that. Uh, on that uh, web address, so let me just say it again. accd.vermont.gov slash event dash types dash vaccine dash clinics. As I mentioned on Friday, we'll continue our walk-in strategy at all our locations. This means you can walk in, whether it is at a pharmacy, a healthcare provider clinic, or a school and get a shot. And we have started distributing vaccine to primary care physicians. This effort, will, as I said last week, will start with Moderna vaccines, but depending on allocation, we hope to expand it to Pfizer and Johnson & Johnson when sufficient supplies are available. We are also focused on a renewed effort to vaccinate the vulnerable population, including the homeless, those on probation and parole under DOC, supervision. In fact, we're going to have pop-up clinics at some of the uh, probation and parole sites, as well as those that initially declined in the incarcerated population. We're asking for a survey of those to find out what their concerns are, and we hope to address those concerns as we uh, move forward. Moving on to our overall progress in Vermont, as of this morning, 423,510 people have been vaccinated with at least one dose uh, against uh, COVID-19. If you are keeping tabs uh, from what I've usually talked about, um, as I mentioned, Vermonters that are 12 and above with at least one dose, that's 76.9%. And I mentioned that, that's the, that's the corrected number. Uh, Vermonters 18 plus with at least one dose. This is what the White House uses as a, sort of their measuring stick that they talked about with uh, having 70% of, uh, of people vaccinated by July 1. Uh, Vermonters 18 plus with at least one dose, we're at 79.4%. And all Vermonters with at least uh, one dose, it, we're at, that's total population, those that are eligible and those that aren't eligible at 67.8 percent. I'll wrap it up by sharing a reminder that as promised our surveillance testing program for summer camps and summer programs is online and available today. Uh, this is available to eligible programs at no cost uh, though through it can you can establish a direct relationship through this program 
with CIC Health for surveillance testing of unvaccinated third to 12th grade campers and your unvaccinated staff. Eligible programs, schools, and camps can complete a form to sign up for the program. Hopefully, you'll receive information directly about this opportunity, but if you didn't, the information in the form is available on the Health Department's website at healthvermont.gov slash COVID-19, then select your community. Vermont, thank you for getting your shot and doing your part to help us cross the finish line strong and meet our goal to vaccinate 80% of our population in this state. I'll now turn it over to Commissioner Squirrel. Thank you, Secretary Smith. Good morning, everyone. It's great to see you all. Thank you for listening in today. Over the past year, we have all been on quite a journey together. We feel the impact that COVID-19 has had on all of us. We feel hope as we look forward and simultaneously feel compelled to drape a protective and reassuring arm around our children and youth who have experienced uncertainty and change over the past year. As we move into recovery as a state, it is still an unprecedented moment in time, one of great optimism and pride as more Vermonters receive vaccinations, we sign our kids up for vaccinations, and we feel a regained sense of freedom and safety. We are also keenly aware of the long-term impacts of the pandemic on our health and well-being. As children and youth return to more in-person activities, and as we as adults adjust to a new normal, we see more clearly the impact of the weight we have all been carrying and the increased mental health needs as a result. For example, we've recently seen an uptick in children and youth presenting in emergency departments for mental health needs, an increased demand for mental health services and supports for children and youth across the state. Now more than ever, as we move towards recovery as a state, we need to focus on our own recovery our own health and wellness, and the health and wellness of our youngest Vermonters. The good news is that Vermont is well poised to meet those needs and to leverage the strengths and assets that we have as a state, whether that is our prestigious ranking as number one in the nation in access to mental health care, our robust and revered school-based mental health systems, and the leadership of the Agency of Education putting front and center the need to prioritize the social, emotional, mental health, and well-being of students as they return to school. We all know that early childhood and adolescence is a critical time to lay the foundation for future success in school, relationships, and life. Vermont has a long history of taking care of our youngest citizens. It's what makes us the great state that we are. We should all feel a sense of relief in having navigated COVID to this point and take note of our own resilience and strength. We should keep in mind that children and youth are resilient. They have great capacity to adapt and change and to bounce back and thrive if we provide the right supports and protective factors around them. Which is why the state is steadfastly committed to supporting our children and youth over the summer with increased access to summer recreational camps, programs, and enrichment opportunities. When we think about healthy development and buffering risk for children and youth, we think about promoting protective factors, social connections, concrete supports, building social and emotional competence. Summer is an opportunity for our children and youth to emerge from the pandemic and participate in safe and flexible programs designed to connect kids with other kids for outdoor adventures, games, and time to discover new interests. We know that one of the key components of resilience is connection. It's tough to bounce back after a major hardship if you think you have to do it all alone. Children and youth do best when they feel that they are important, an important part of something and when they feel a belonging to a larger community Access to summer and community programs is key. Summer enrichment can also be a great place for children to acquire new skills, which can then lead to a sense of accomplishment and boost their self-esteem. 
Summer enrichment activities allow kids to be physically active, to socialize with other kids, to unplug from screens, and to challenge themselves in a supportive environment. While we often see these activities as just regular components of childhood and growing up, we are learning more and more that these are essential brain building exercises that give our children and youth the best chance to thrive as adults. At the Governor's Youth Summit earlier this year, we heard directly from children and youth from across Vermont. They told us what they need. They wanna focus on socializing again. They miss that feeling of unity they get from riding bikes together, creating things, cooking, and hands-on summer activities. They want more time to play and to use their imagination. Believe it or not, they said they want to do away with their screens to connect with their peers in ways that they haven't been able to. And they advocated for more support and tools for their mental health. They want to build tools for coping and for supporting one another, to connect, to build more kindness, more laughter, more joy, and more gratitude. These are their words. This is why summer 2021 will be such an important time for Vermont's children and youth, to regain that sense of community, and connection that they've been missing. Which is why Governor Scott, Senator Bernie Sanders, Vermont After School, and the Agency of Education recently outlined a grant opportunity aimed at enhancing and expanding summertime enrichment opportunities for children and youth across the state. The response to this call to expand summer opportunities and programs has been incredible and we are thrilled by the proposals from communities and summer programs to create more opportunities for our children and youth this summer. True to form, it is clear that we are all in this together when it comes to supporting Vermont's kids. The results of this recent grant opportunity through Vermont After School will be announced in the next few days. This will increase summer programming, extending hours and weeks of, of supports, all aimed at ensuring that Vermont kids can re-engage in recreational interests, reconnect with their friends, and rebuild that sense of optimism and sense of connection. I would also encourage parents and caregivers to go to the Summer Matters page on the Vermont After School website, vermontafterschool.org slash summer matters. Here you can find information on summer camp and enrichment opportunities, and there's also a page for families with tips and resources on how to talk with your children and youth to prepare them for more social interaction, summer camps, and programs. The well-being of our children and youth across the state is an urgent and important priority and a benchmark for our recovery in Vermont. We know this, and these are the values that make Vermont great. We're rolling up our sleeves as a state working collaboratively with both public and private partners to support our Vermont kids and provide them with enriching opportunities this summer so that they can thrive. Thank you very much for your time this morning and now I'm going to turn it over to Commissioner Pichek for a modeling update. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Squirrel and uh, good morning everybody. Uh, I'm happy to report that for the uh, seventh straight week in a row, our modeling report contains a lot of good news. Uh, in fact, across the board, Vermont's COVID-19 numbers are better now than at any point over the last six weeks, or six months, rather. Uh, first and most fortunately, Vermont has gone over a week without someone dying of COVID-19 in our state, the first time this has happened in over 28 weeks and we are one of the only states in the country that did not have a COVID-19 fatality this past week. Further, as Vermont's COVID-19 fatality rate remains low and we continue to forecast that May will have the fewest COVID-19 fatalities in over six months. Vermont also remains the state with the fewest individuals currently hospitalized in the country on a per capita basis. This past week, our hospital rates continued to decline, down over 20% over the last week, and down over 36% over the last 14 days. The average age of hospitalizations is also continuing to trend down, 
and uh, hospitalizations continue to be at a six-month low, and we anticipate these numbers will continue to fall in the weeks ahead. We've also seen great improvement in our newly reported cases this week. We're reporting 219 new COVID-19 cases, 138 fewer this week when compared to last, with our seven-day case rate average falling 39% this week and having fallen an impressive 85% since April 1st, bringing our seven-day average to its lowest point in the last six months. Further, we're generally seeing cases uniformly decrease across Vermont, with almost every county seeing their cases fall, and cases are also declining across all age groups. Further, the number of Vermonters who are currently infected with COVID-19 is also plummeting, down over 70% over the last seven weeks. And we are also at a six-month low on this metric, and we can continue to see how much safer our communities are as a result. For example, for the second week in a row, there are currently no active outbreaks in a long-term care facility in Vermont, and we haven't reported a case in a resident at a long-term care facility in over two weeks. Similarly, we are reporting 17 new COVID-19 cases in Vermont's K through 12 schools, the lowest weekly total absent a school vacation that we have seen since before Thanksgiving of last year. We also saw college cases declining on campus as they headed toward the end of their semester. And now our college reporting will conclude. But we did want to briefly summarize the semester that they had. It was certainly challenging in many regards. They had 1,167 cases reported this semester. However, when you look at the amount of testing that was conducted, you see the positivity rate was still very low. And in fact, the percent of college cases in the spring relative to Vermont's overall case count was lower compared to the cases that colleges experienced last fall and the cases that we saw in Vermont. So colleges and universities were able to keep classes open and students safe. And one of the main reasons they were able to do this was because of the tremendous amount of testing that they conducted, over 370,000 tests conducted in the spring semester. In fact, if we were to look at that number and compare it to the amount of testing that was conducted across the country during that period, January 15th to May 17th, Vermont colleges and universities did more testing than five U.S. states during that period of time. So it shows you just how much testing occurred on campus and how important that was to keeping our campuses open and safe. So th certainly a big thank you to everyone that was involved uh, in the college reopening and keeping college students safe in Vermont. Taking a look at the Vermont uh, case forecast, we continue to trend very closely to the April 26th projection with cases following a steady decline. Further, our most uh, recent forecasts anticipate that cases will continue to fall and soon we'll get into the single digits on a regular basis. Turning to our vaccinations, even with the reconciliation that uh, Secretary Smith mentioned, Vermont continues to lead the nation in many categories. One of the most important categories, of course, is the percent of our 65 and older uh, who is vaccinated. Currently, 98% have started. Close to 90% have completed that vaccination. And you can see the impact in our case results. We only had eight cases this past week in people over 65 years old. So in that very high uh, vaccinated age group, very few cases. And overall, uh, we now uh, estimate that 235 Vermont lives were saved to date because of the vaccine. And importantly, we continue to have one of the highest rates in the country regarding Vermonters continuing to initiate vaccination, and we are well above the national average, meaning the goal of hitting that 80% mark is within sight. And as Secretary Smith mentioned, you can see the progress we're making toward our 80% vaccination goal, with 76.9% of eligible Vermonters having started vaccination, leaving only 17,250 Vermonters remaining until we do hit that goal, which does appear to be coming in the next week to 10 days. For the seventh straight week, we are continuing to see the virus in retreat across the Northeast as well. Cases this week totaled just under 20,000, for the first time since last September, representing a decrease of 8,400 cases compared to last week. And over the last five weeks, the region has improved 
by 78%. Hospitalizations are also down in the region, as are deaths. And New England continues to lead the nation in the uptake of the vaccine across the board, with all six New England states in the top 10 in terms of the percent of their population having started vaccination. And another bit of good news, Quebec is also seeing considerable increase in their vaccination rates as of late, with over 55% of its population having started vaccination as well. And because of these uh, very high vaccination rates, we anticipate the favorable trends and the improvements that we're seeing across the region uh, will continue for the foreseeable future. Now, at this time, I would like to uh, introduce Dr. Levine. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, this morning, I'll be talking about transitions and some second dose issues and Memorial Day. But uh, I wanted to pick up on the college theme for just a second because Tuesdays are the day that we have been consistently meeting as an Department of Health with all of our colleges uh, weekly for way over a year now. Uh, and it's been such a successful collaboration in setting all of the important policies that the colleges have adhered to, as well as their testing regimes, quarantine regimes, case identification, and most recently, vaccination. Um, and you saw the data. It's been a very successful experience uh, for a college in Vermont, as successful as it can be during a pandemic. I know it wasn't the experience every student imagined they would have. Um, our cases have essentially been in the 20s per night, but last night we did see a single-digit night, nine cases. Um, we'll hope that that begins a trend, but either way, we're still at a much lower level, as you've seen. We've not had a death since May 16th. We've had 10 hospitalizations today, two in the ICU, a seven-day positivity rate of 1.2%. As you know, we've been most focused on vaccination rates because of its impact on all the other data, cases, hospitalizations, and deaths. Now more than three quarters of all eligible Vermonters age 12 and above have gotten at least one dose of vaccine. We continue to make truly amazing strides as a state, leading the country by our example. And we're quickly approaching that new 80% benchmark that will allow us to move ahead without the restrictions that we once needed to stay safe. I know that we all welcome this, being able to do all the things we love in a way that looks normal again, where we don't have to worry so much about things like masks and distancing. I also know that many of us need time to adjust our psyche and habits to this transition, a reflection of how deeply COVID-19 prevention and care practices have really become ingrained in our daily routines. Acts that are what have made our ability to move out of the pandemic restrictions possible. But when the final lifting of these restrictions and recommendations do arrive, I encourage everyone to embrace them at whatever pace is comfortable for you. And I want to remind you why we are making it. <clears throat> We have such a strong layer of protection in Vermont through vaccination. It protects the nearly 430,000 people who receive their vaccine, and it makes it less likely for the virus to spread. That means it also protects people who are not vaccinated, including our kids who are under age 12 and can't get vaccinated right now. And as the data shows, younger children are less likely to spread the virus than older children and adults. So we expect to see less transmission among their own age groups. I don't have any new news to report to you regarding trials in the under 12, though Moderna is now reporting results in the 12 to 15 year age group that are as equally uh, promising and positive as those reported by Pfizer. As we move towards that new normal, I know there will be plenty of questions, but even as we take these steps, I urge you to keep your mask with you. Maybe a business will still require them, or maybe it just will make someone else more comfortable. 
I'm particularly thinking about people who have a medical condition that means their immune system may not respond to the vaccine with the same vigor, or those who are still waiting for their two weeks to be up to receive the benefit of their second dose. While we navigate these changes, we'll need to make our own decisions about what's best for ourselves, our families, and those around us. Keep in mind that as we vaccinate more Vermonters each day, and we keep this virus at the low levels it's currently at, it does become less of a threat to us all. <clears throat> so keep up the good work. I mean, it matters. I thank all of you, especially young Vermonters, who have been taking advantage of some of our special vaccination opportunities, whether at North Beach, a racetrack, or your workplace. And keep helping us spread the word about these opportunities to anyone who's not yet vaccinated. Let me add one important message to those of you who have gotten vaccinated. If you do get a shot that requires two doses, meaning Pfizer or Moderna, make sure to come back for that second dose. It really is key to your health. Getting both doses gives you the highest level of protection from COVID-19. When we look at participants in the clinical trials who did not receive both doses, they really weren't followed for a very, very long period of time. So we really don't know for sure how well or how long one dose will protect you. I'm often asked about the need for and the timing of what are currently hypothetical booster doses. Those are still being studied, but far more important right now is maximizing your immunity today. Taking the full vaccine course offers better protection against variants of the virus. We know these are still circulating. We know that the vaccine is doing a great job with them, and we need to keep doing everything we can to keep them at bay. This means getting as many Vermonters fully vaccinated as we can. Fully vaccinated, of course, meaning it's been two weeks since your final dose. So if you don't already have an appointment or plans, to walk in for that second dose, do it now. Make sure you're scheduling that final shot as much a priority as getting the first dose was. Obviously, if you want to finish a race, you don't stop halfway. So visit healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine to see the many easy and convenient options for getting your first or final vaccine dose. And if it's your second, be sure to bring your vaccination card with you when you go. Finally, this weekend is Memorial Day. Throughout this pandemic, I've usually shared guidance on what we shouldn't do for the holidays. Public health is often accused of being the wet blanket, finger wagger, having too much guidance, often tilted to the restrictive side. This time, I'd like to celebrate for a moment all the things we can do again, thanks to the vaccine, for those who are fully vaccinated. You can resume activities that you did prior to the pandemic. You can get together with friends and family, most likely without masks and distancing if you're fully vaccinated. You can grill, swim, vote with your friends and family. You can go to a farmer's market, a concert, a car race, or a baseball game. You can travel without having to get tested or quarantine upon your return to Vermont. I'm not going to try to plan your entire social calendar, and I'll even skip our list of summer public health safety tips just this once, but it's on our website if you can't wait. For now, let's just appreciate all we can do and how far we've come. And it looks like the governor has returned from his phone call. Thank you, Dr. Levine, and good morning, everyone. I, um, as with every Tuesday, just got off the phone with fellow governors, the CDC director, uh, Dr. Walensky, White House officials, and others, and here's what we heard. Dr. W Walensky uh, emphasized the national numbers continue to move in the right direction in respect to vaccinations, as well as cases, hospitalizations, and deaths. She again reiterated the effectiveness and safety of the vaccines for those ages 12 and over. And the federal government will continue helping us move forward on our vaccination efforts. 
again, we heard, um, we heard we'll remain steady in our allocation of Pfizer and Moderna. Um, and again, we won't receive any J&J &J doses this weekend or this week. Uh, as I've said over the last few weeks, we can and will be able to meet our goal with these allocations and we continue ordering more through the federal pool system. They also reported uh, there were only seven states who have asked for more through the federal pool and Vermont is amongst them. So we'll continue to ask for more uh, doses as we see fit, especially with um, with J&J. &J which they said there is some in the federal system. Next, as you heard from Secretary Smith and Commissioner Pichek, we're making good progress towards our goal of 80% of the 12 and over population receiving at least one dose of the vaccine. Though, as they noted, we're not quite as close as we thought. But even with this change, the pace at which Vermonters are stepping up still shows exactly what we've seen throughout this pandemic and well before. The Vermonters are willing uh, to help their neighbors and do their part for the greater good. As we move towards our goal, there are a few things I wanted to talk about today. First, hitting 80% of the eligible population, which is over 70% of the total population, will be an incredible achievement and something we should all be proud of when we do indeed hit it. As I said on Friday, it means we can safely remove restrictions because the vaccine is doing its job and the virus has few avenues to spread. Think about it this way. We're heading toward a time when about three out of every four Vermonters will be vaccinated, which significantly lowers the chance you'll encounter someone who is unvaccinated. The chance uh, someone has COVID is getting lower every single day. Importantly, as the CDC has said, vaccinated people are not only protecting themselves, they also have a low risk of spreading it to others. And our data clearly shows that. As we not only see hospitalizations and deaths dropping, uh, but also cases. Uh, in fact, we had nine cases yesterday uh, and we have uh, we have to look back to the latter part of October uh, to see that happening previously. Recent cases have been largely concentrated in the 18 to 29 age band, which we know has had a much slower uptake of the vaccine. So hopefully uh, that data alone motivates more in the age group to find a site and get your shot. Second, I want folks to know that when we do hit 80%, we're not going to be satisfied. While it will be safe to remove restrictions at that point, we're still going to push hard to get as many Vermonters vaccinated as possible. Because with all the infrastructure we have in place and knowing the fall and winter may bring more transmission amongst the unvaccinated, we want to get that unvaccinated number as low as we possibly can right now. So please, if you haven't gotten your shot yet, you can find a clinic today at healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine. It's never been easier. You can help push us closer to full reopening and you can help put us in a better position than any other state to see a long lasting impact from the vaccine. Before we move to questions, I wanted to note that I signed a proclamation uh, today to make uh, this day, George Floyd Remembrance Day in Vermont. Mr. Floyd's death uh, one year ago was a murder under the knee of a law enforcement officer who swore to keep us safe. His death was tragic and importantly sparked a national conversation about how to address racism, modernize law enforcement and more. I think it's important we reflect on what we saw with our own eyes on, that, on this anniversary and make sure we continue this work, which is why it was important to mark today with a proclamation. My thoughts are with his friends, family, and our entire country today. With that, we'll now move back to questions or start questions, I guess. 
Thank you, Governor. So probably uh, for, for Dr. Levine, you mentioned, uh, you know, stressing that people need to show up for their second shots. How, ma how many people aren't showing up? So that's a, obviously an evolving number because you have a number of weeks, even if you don't time it exactly for the three-week or the four-week mark. Uh, the more recent numbers are anywhere from 2 to 3 percent to 5 percent. Um, so not huge, but again, still significant. Um, and the goal is to obviously convert all of those to people who will find a convenient time uh, and location, which should be very easy to get their shot. And I know that um, I asked last week, but just a quick clarification too. When we hit that 80% threshold, you know, will, will the notification will it come out in a tweet or a emergency press conference? I guess what what will be that that method of communication to people? Yeah. you know, it depends on when it is, obviously, um, but uh, hopefully we'll be able to have a quick uh, press conference to mark the occasion and let everybody know that it happens. Uh, that's part of what we, I'd said on Friday that we were going to let people know on a daily basis uh, to be transparent. And obviously uh, the information or the data we were receiving wasn't quite correct. So um, we've rectified that, but we'll continue to provide this, uh, this information every day. Uh, and uh, so nobody will be surprised when we do hit it and we'll try and uh, get together and have a press conference on that day. And then I guess just my last question, I think it's either Governor for you or for Commissioner Harrington about the new work search requirement and the data. So I was looking over some of the unemployment data and it appears that um, in the past two weeks, uh, claimant date or initial claims has dropped from about 43,000 to 23,000 since the work search requirement was reinstated. Um, I guess I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, how many people have entered the workforce versus just filing for, for UI? Yeah, that might be a better question yeah. for uh, Commissioner Harrington. And again, you know, it's uh, as we vaccinate more people, as the case counts drop, as uh, we move into the summer uh, and things are opening back up, we are going to see a natural progression to people getting back to work, which is great news uh, for us. But uh, Commissioner Harrington, anything you can add to that? Uh, thank you, Governor. I would agree with what you said. It, for us, in the numbers perspective, it's a little too early for us to tell just based on the way um, the federal government and our team uh, identify the unemployment rate. So, um, you know, the work search has only been a couple of weeks. I would say that it's probably a combination of two things. Uh, one is obviously people needing to look for work and returning to work. The other component in there um, is that we've been doing a lot of cleaning up and catching of initial claims fraud. Uh, so again, part of what you're probably seeing is a residual effect of taking the online application offline. Uh, and we saw those uh, initial claims applications drop you know, by almost 90% when we took that application offline. So what you're seeing now uh, is kind of the waterfall effect or the downstream effect, which means we were able to stop so many claims from going into the system. It's also impacting what would be the number of continued claims uh, which we're seeing now. So I think it's a combination of both, but to the governor's point, um, you know, I would just reiterate that with restrictions easing uh, with employers, um, wanting to expand and grow. Um, you know, there's certainly a need out there for talent in the workforce. And with the work search coming back on, you know, we will see more and more people uh, each week return uh, to the workforce. I think as well with the hospitality sector being so dramatically affected, um, having more people traveling, we're seeing the numbers tick up a bit there. And typically around the Memorial Day, things start to open back up, whether it's restaurants and lodging and campgrounds, uh, state parks uh, have started to open back up as well. So it's a big weekend for us. Thank you. I know it's a bit early, but uh, have you looked at the budget and um, do you see any problems or where are we at? You know, I haven't, um, and just so that everybody understands, uh, I know when the, when the budget or a piece of legislation passes in the, in the uh, legislature, they think it automatically just comes to uh, my desk and is ready to be either signed or vetoed, uh, but that's just not the case. We have a number of uh, pieces of legislation that have not arrived. In fact, we have 
no bills awaiting my signature uh, in my office at this point. Um, so we expect there, there are going to be at least a dozen uh, in the next few days coming, but the budget will not be part of it. The budget will usually takes about uh, a, a week or two, maybe more, for legislative council, the legislature's council, to take a look and make sure I, all the I's are dotted, T's are crossed, and, and everything is working uh, the way it should. So um, I haven't seen any uh, issues with it. Uh, as I noted in my address to the legislature, I think they did some pretty good work. Uh, we were able to work together, come um, to, to a point where um, I think everyone uh, can be satisfied with the outcome. So I was very, uh, very appreciative of that. Good morning. Uh, picking up on that, you were pretty effusive in your praise of legislative leadership in your farewell message. Uh, any disappointments this year? Uh, what in what areas do we fall short? Act 250. Act 250 reform. Um, but that didn't uh, that didn't make it out of the gate, and uh, that's something that we need to address. Uh, it's going to be a bottleneck. Uh, has been a bottleneck and will continue to be a bottleneck unless we address this 50-year-old uh, law uh, that needs to be updated. And so I'm hopeful uh, we'll continue to have, uh, I guess, uh, conversations uh, with leadership about this, and hopefully Vermonters will have conversations with their legislators about this because it's important. I ask you a political question. Would you like to see Senator Leahy run for re-election next year? Yes. Uh, finally, that's a remarkable economy of word. Uh, <laughs> finally, I uh, got, got an email this morning from a guy who has a lot of um, truck driving friends, and he said he gets frustrated hearing you say how easy it is to get um, a vaccine. He said many of these guys don't have computers. They have company flip phones. Until you can just pull over, walk into a pharmacy, get a shot on demand, get back in your truck and drive away and continue with your work, they won't do it. What do you say to folks like that? Well, I think you can in some cases. We are, you know, we have many walk-in clinics and, uh, and I know it's uh, difficult to figure out where they are, but if you... Um, We'll do our best to continue to try and communicate that. And many, I believe there are many of the pharmacies that have adopted this method of walk-in uh, clinics. So um, give it a try. Uh, give, uh, give your pharmacy a, a call uh, to see your, your regular pharmacy or one you're going to be driving by and, uh, and see if they can. Uh, that would be the easiest thing to do, even with a flip phone. But, but the true, just spontaneous walk-in, um, what's the best advice there? Well, again, pay attention uh, to the information we are giving you like today. I, I, I wasn't here for uh, Secretary Smith's um, address, uh, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> he, he might have mentioned where you could walk in. Uh, Secretary Smith, is there anything you could add to that? Yes, Stuart. Any of the um, healthcare providers, that's uh, many of the uh, local hospitals, have walk-in capability through their vaccination clinics. We do have walk-in capabilities at all of our um, all of our sort of pop-up clinics that we have now, and uh, uh, pharmacies do have walk-in capabilities uh, throughout the state. I would just tell your friends just to walk in and ask. Um, chances are they're going to get an opportunity where they can get vaccinated. Certainly, um, the clinics that we're having out there uh, have this walking capability. And like I said, we had 30 of them last weekend where you could simply walk in um, as you're as you're going by. So, I I would ask your uh, truck driving um, audience to. Uh, uh, to just try it, to stop and try it and see and see what happens. And if not, just give the uh, our uh, vaccine hotline a call and we'll we'll try to arrange something for them. 
Thank you both. Stuart, um, maybe we'll challenge ourselves here a bit. On Friday, uh, we'll try and come up with a list of those clinics, those uh, uh, those pharmacies that have capacity and then you, that you can walk in and we'll let you know and, and maybe you can communicate that uh, to the folks that uh, read or listen uh, to your programs. Will do. Lisa, the AP. Hi, thanks. Um, this is a question for Secretary Smith. I'm wondering if you can give us an update on um, plans to replace the Woodside uh, Youth Detention Center. Is with um, are you still moving ahead with the plans for the privately run facility, smaller facility in Newbury, and hope to have that done by the end of the year? We're still moving forward with those plans. We're meeting with local officials as we uh, as we speak, making sure that we go through the various processes that we have to do at the local level. Um, and that's where we are right now, uh, making sure that we have all sort of the, um, the, the permitting in place and the various aspects of, uh, of that facility, uh, but making sure that we are meeting with uh, locals and, and local officials. So um, I'll report on more progress on this uh, in next week as we uh, move forward, but that's where we are right now, Lisa. Thanks. And then how many, um, is New Hampshire currently housing some Vermont youth? We have a contract with, uh, yeah, we have a contract with New Hampshire. I don't believe, and I will double check on this, but I don't believe we have anybody in that facility right now. Okay. And, and if we were to have someone there, we have a contract with them. Are you, how confident are you that they'll be well cared for given the the center in New Hampshire is under criminal investigation. Yeah, as you as, of alleged abuse. Yeah, as you mentioned, those those allegations date back um, uh, a few years ago, um, and we've been assured. And in our contract, we have certain provisions dealing with the safety of our uh, youth that are placed in in that facility. But right now, we we use that facility very sparingly. I can think of only one mm -hmm. right now that we've used it in terms of an in-state placement. Um, we have used it one other time, I think, with somebody that was a fugitive in another state that was caught in this state and then um, placed in uh, Sununu. But we use that very, very sparingly. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Good afternoon, Governor. Um, on the topic of the data not being 100% accurate uh, as we work to approach an 80% vaccination rate for those that qualify, um, as you know, I was uh, fortunate to be vaccinated early on as a, as a firefighter under the 1A program. Uh, and I recently logged into the health department's COVID-19 portal and discovered that my vaccine was never registered in that system. Um, you know, I was one of thousands of 1A workers that were uh, vaccinated early on and way before that portal was even stood up. I'm wondering how we know for sure that several thousand people, may, I don't know, maybe 10,000 people are being counted towards this 80% goal if, uh, if the state system doesn't even know that we've been vaccinated. Yeah, we're, we're receiving our, our data from the CDC, so uh, they should have that, but um, Commissioner Levine might be able to answer it. Uh, I'm not sure what portal you're referring to, Greg, uh, but we have an immunization registry that has a recording of all the immunizations that have occurred, plus <clears throat> we're using the CDC data. What I think you're saying, though, is that you're concerned we might be undercounting as opposed to overcounting, and that we may have gotten there already. Uh, I don't think that's the issue. Um, I do think that uh, we can we can find your name in our registry. I'm quite confident. 
I, I'm referring to the portal where uh, Vermonters go online to, to sign up for a vaccine or sign up for uh, a COVID test. That's um, yeah, that's I, what I, I know. Uh, I'm, I'm also eligible to sign up for a vaccine, even though I've already been vaccinated. That part I don't understand, and uh, if you would email me, I will have our data team look at that. But that is certainly not the portal where we use data to figure out how many Vermonters have been vaccinated. That is a registration portal, and that's its major purpose. So it would be on our immunization registry where we'd have your accurate data. Okay, uh, and, and uh, you think it's pretty likely that we're gonna we're gonna get to eighty percent in the in the near future, Governor? Maybe by Memorial Day, or or what are your thoughts on that? Um, I was surprised we were making so much progress last weekend, uh, so I'm a little hesitant to make any any uh, uh, guesses as to when we might hit this. But I, if you take the number of people over the last seven days, uh, I think it's slightly between 2,500 and 3,000 per day. That may drop off a bit, especially with this weekend coming up. So I'm, I would guess it's going to be um, after Memorial Day, but you know, probably the middle of the week, uh, sometime next week. But who knows? Uh, we might have some good days and all of the clinics and walk-ins that we have available uh, may surprise all of us again. So we'll uh, stay tuned on that. And, and hopefully, I, I would like to say uh, that we would hit uh, that mark, the 80% mark before Memorial Day. But um, I think it's likely it'll be into next week. Okay. And uh, lastly here, uh, with the state reopening many aspects of, of state government, um, you know, it's been it's been well over a year since the DMV in St. Albans has been open, which is, is certainly a, a strain to Franklin County uh, to have to travel, you know, sometimes 45 minutes or an hour uh, to get to the DMV. Um, if the objective is to be working more remotely and, and in smaller numbers, I'm, I'm curious why the DMV wouldn't reopen the, the St. Albans office, at least on a, on a part-time basis, in order to work in smaller numbers and, and I'm wondering if you can elaborate on that and and maybe give us a, a little update on on when we might see that office open yeah I'd like to be able to give you an update but uh, I wasn't aware that we weren't par open uh, part-time so I'll have to look into it and get back to you and and uh, I'll have somebody from motor vehicle or uh, the agency of transportation get in touch with you and maybe give you that information but I, I wasn't aware that it was completely closed down Okay. Appreciate it, Governor, and uh, thank you for your time. Cameron, St. Albans Messenger. Cameron, St. Albans Messenger. He's probably at the DMV. All right, we'll go to Lisa, the Valley Reporter. Good afternoon. Um, my first question is for Secretary of French. Will the ALE consider lifting guidelines around social distancing at outdoor year-end celebrations that occur after statewide reopening takes place? I believe the current guidelines call for households to be seated six feet from each other in socially distanced pods if they're under tent. Yeah, thanks, Lisa. I mean, Dr. Levine and I are having those conversations now, but we haven't made any final decision, but we're you know, certainly very pleased with the progress uh, Vermonters are making towards vaccination, and uh, we'll be factoring that into our decision making here in the next couple of days. Great, thank you. And this question is for Dr. Levine: Has the state seen any post-vaccine cardi cardiac complications in 12 to 15 year olds? And has the state seen any cases where kids who had COVID had post-infection cardiac issues? Good. So just so the general audience understands, there have been reports of something called myocarditis, which is an inflammation of the heart. Um, most of these came from Europe, 
uh, though there have been some in the United States, predominantly after receiving vaccine in the adolescent population. So far, um, the CDC has said that it is under review. They are actually reluctant to say that there's a true causal association. Uh, they have very few cases to work with, apparently, and it's unclear, but because they have uh, been very um, deliberate in their approach and are doing an extensive review, it clearly doesn't sound like something that um, is something that they would want to immediately say something about to alert the population. It seems like it's quite unclear at this point in time. So that's really all I can offer on that because it's such a small number of cases. With regard to just uh, general cardiac issues after having COVID, uh, I don't have a clear number for you in the pediatric population. Uh, it clearly is not being reported with a significant frequency or we would really have uh, put out uh, an alert notification regarding it. Most of the pediatricians and colleges uh, are all abiding by some protocols to make sure that athletes don't return to a uh, previous level of uh, training or competition after COVID without at least uh, understanding that they need to have an assessment and um, make sure that there is no issue. But I don't believe we've really had much going on in Vermont with regard to post-COVID cardiac symptoms or um, conditions. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, this question is also for Secretary French, and I think it, it might sort of repeat the question that Lisa just asked, but I was just wondering if, um, with, with high school commencements around the corner, if, um, you know, in order to head off any confusion about public and press access to commencement exercises, whether AOE has issued guidance um, to schools about graduation access, and uh, if so, what is that guidance? Or, if I understand correctly, it sounds like you're still in the in the, um, from what Lisa asked, it sounds like you're still in the process of formulating that guidance. Uh, could, you, could you clarify that for me a little bit? Yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> well, we have published guidance on graduation. I think Lisa's question was more to or to what extent we would be uh, modifying that guidance if a uh, state of emergency were to expire. Um, and that's what we're currently uh, considering at this point. But we have published uh, the guidance for graduation that's been out for several weeks. Okay, um, that's available on the website? Absolutely, yep. Okay, and that, and that includes media access as well as, as public and family access? Uh, I'd have to check about the media access, but certainly uh, family and so forth access is delineated. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you very much. That's all my questions. Hi, uh, Governor. I'm wondering, you know, in light of your uh, proclamation today about the killing of George Floyd and acknowledging issues around systemic racism, um, what are you planning on doing in the next year to address issues of systemic racism and inequality in Vermont? Do you have any priorities or specific um, things that you think the state needs to tackle and will be advocating and pushing for? Yeah, a lot of it, you know, surrounds education, talking about this, being more transparent, calling it out when we see it, and uh, doing our best in the uh, in the workplace as well as uh, um, in, in the way we treat one another. Um, we are fortunate to have a, a very qualified director uh, now, Susanna Davis, and uh, we, uh, we are in constant communication with her. She's part of the cabinet. In fact, we talked about a few issues today. So um, we'll continue uh, to try and do better. Um, I think we all need to do better in this regard. Um, but we've, um, we've made some, some giant, uh, giant strides uh, in Somerset, but we have a lot of strides left to go uh, before we uh, can say that we've uh, moved the needle uh, substantially. So. Uh, again, I think all of us need to work together, pull in the same direction in order to 
to get to the, uh, to the goal of treating one another uh, equitably. Well, could, could you offer a little more specificity on like what you, know, I, you talk about some yeah. giant strides that we could make? Like what, what is one that, that you think we you know, could be doing right yeah. now? Uh, well, again, I think uh, what we're, we're doing in, in terms of uh, training, uh, in terms of law enforcement, is something that we're doing right now. Uh, we're uh, with the uh, um, with all the new uh, provisions that we put into place. Uh, I think that that's that's one. It's it's not going to be overnight. It's going to take uh, some time. But I but I feel good about where the approach we're taking and the direction we're moving in. So I would guess that was uh, that's a pretty big one. Okay. Um, thank you. And then just briefly, um, in the reopening, uh, once we hit the 80% mark of vaccinations, is that going to include um, people who are incarcerated? Uh, you know, I know there's been a number of restrictions on the operations of, of state prisons over the last year, including not visitations for family. And um, are, are those restrictions going to be lifted as well once we hit 80%? I can, uh, I'll let... Secretary Smith answered that, but uh, I think we will relax in some areas. But I know the CDC uh, has uh, put guidelines out in terms of certain situations and, and uh, our offender population being one of them. So um, we will continue to pay attention to their guidance, but, uh, but we certainly want to open uh, back up in, in, in terms of programming and, and so forth. Secretary Smith. Yeah, Liam, I'm just going to reiterate what the, what the governor said. We want to open back up uh, across the board. We have to pay attention to the guidance that the CDC has outlined. But certainly vaccinations um, will play a large part in how we open up uh, our, our correctional facilities. But the goal is to open them back up, both to visitation, to volunteers, and other activities as we move forward. We are the first time. Uh, we, there, we don't have a facility that's in, well, the first time in a long time, we don't have a facility that's in total lockdown. Um, we had, uh, as of uh, last night, we had zero um, uh, inmates that had uh, uh, COVID-19. We have, uh, I think, two um, in, in the workforce that, that do, but not associated with the facility or not in the facility. So I think we're on our way to really uh, having an opportunity to um, open our facilities back up. We still have to get our inmate population a little bit more vaccinated than it is now. We have about 65% of the inmate population that's vaccinated. We really need to uh, boost that up a little bit to where the general population is. And as I mentioned in my remarks, I think uh, Commissioner Baker, We'll team up with uh, Commissioner Levine to see if we can convince some people um, uh, to take uh, a, a vaccination in that facility. But um, I, you know, our hope is to have it as open as possible in, you know, in the next uh, few weeks to a month. So do, do you have, though, just briefly, like a, a specific metric that, that you're looking at when you would reopen? Is it the 80%? of inmates being vaccinated or what, what's the metric there? Yeah, we haven't put a metric on it yet, um, but I would like to see it mirror the general population. And again, um, making sure that we, we abide by the recommendations of the CDC in any sort of reopening, but I would like to see it mirror uh, the population. The, uh, the um, employee population is about that, about 80%. If I remember correctly, it would be nice if we could get the inmate population to that level as well. Thank you. And just to be clear, Liam, uh, and I, I'm sure that uh, um, Secretary Smith has said this before, but about a third of the f offender population has refused the vaccination. So it's not as though we haven't tried and we're going uh, back at it uh, as, as well. Uh, trying to educate and, and trying to counsel uh, the offender population to get vaccinated because it's important. Tom, Compass, Vermont. 
Thank you. Uh, I have no questions today. Thanks very much. Thank you, Tom. Aaron, VP Digger. Um, I, uh, related to the um, work search requirements, um, the Department of Labor issued an update last Friday that said all issues relating to entering work search information were resolved, but a handful of folks have reached out to BT Digger saying that they're still having issues filing their claims. And yesterday, the DOL issued another notice acknowledging that issues are still ongoing. Do you have any more details you can share on those issues? And uh, how much longer will Vermonters have to wait before they're finally able to file? Commissioner Harrington. Sure. Yeah, thank you, Governor. Um, so the issue were the, the one piece, and I, I, I'm reluctant to call it an issue because it's a known uh, technical correction that has to take place. So right now, um, in my mind, there's no uh, unknown issue or known issue that's preventing people from filing their claims. Uh, there was a group of uh, early claimants who came in uh, during the height of the pandemic, uh, and we classified those claimants, we classify them in our system in A claimant, which means they can bypass the work search. It allowed them to file over the phone uh, through our automated system early on in the pandemic when our phone lines were getting overrun with calls. Uh, once we were able to get our call center up and running, we didn't need that, uh, that designation anymore. Um, so uh, we stopped putting it in place. But there are some of those claimants who were still unemployed back then that still had a A classification. Um, it's a technical correction that has to happen in the system um, to remove the A classification so that they don't automatically bypass the work search. We are asking those individuals to still conduct their uh, work search contacts three a week. Um, they're just not being asked to uh, provide those when they file their weekly claim. So they can still file their claims. We're still processing those claims. We're still paying those claims. They're just not being asked to submit who did they contact as part of the work search and what was, all, what was the job that you applied for, so on and so forth. We still want them to be doing that work, but we're, not, we're also not going to go back retroactively in time uh, and make them report old weeks. So uh, my understanding is um, from our technical team, we hope to have that um, corrected, but it's a mainframe uh, technical issue. So from that perspective, um, it's kind of out of the hands of the general business and, and needing um, some additional uh, technical resources to make that uh, switch occur. Uh, but like I said, um, it's not preventing those folks from filing their claims. They just don't have to provide their work search when they do it. And it is a relatively small uh, subset of the population, those folks that came in very early on in the pandemic. I mean, we are getting messages from claimants who are on their third week or, or even longer without receiving benefits um, and others who are complaining about hours long wait times on the helpline for assistance. Do you have a message for those people? So uh, without getting into or looking at a specific claim, there are a number of reasons why we wouldn't be paying out a claim. Um, and so it really, I can't say that all the reasons why a claim isn't getting paid are due to a technical issue. There are times where we come across something, uh, you know, on an individual basis that does require us to submit a ticket for um, corrective action in the mainframe or with our vendor. Um, but in general, there's no massive outage or group of people that can't file right now. Um, it could also be that the way they completed their, their previous application, uh, you know, caused uh, the system to raise a red flag that caused further review. So there are a number of reasons why folks uh, may still be allowed to file. Uh, and there are many times if someone is in filing status, they can still file their weekly claims. But if the claim is under review, uh, then it wouldn't pay out until that review has taken place. So. Um, you know, again, it's hard to talk in generality because it could uh, be associated with a number of different things. Um, the, the wait time, I would just, the only thing I would say to those folks is we are absolutely aware, and this has not changed um, since even before the pandemic, that Monday mornings uh, and or Mondays are our highest call days. Um, and it seems that people are, are very interested in calling on Mondays, even though we've told them, please call on a different day. Um, but our call center is quickly overloaded on that one day. Um, also, we also know that in the mornings, people like to call as soon as the call center opens up. So when I look at volume uh, across uh, each day and each hour, 
um, each day of the week at 8 a.m. A number of people like to call right at 8 a.m. Um, there was also obviously an influx about a week ago when um, we first had the work search uh, issues that were corrected. So, um, you know, that also caused volume to go up. So what, what I'm not seeing, though, is necessarily a trend where, um, you know, people are needing to wait for an hour at a time at any time of the day when they call. Um, our average wait time across all our lines is actually less than uh, 10 minutes, typically. Um, but if everybody calls at 8 a.m. in the morning or if you call on a Monday, um, you are likely to get a high volume call time. And I would just encourage those folks to call back uh, in the afternoon or call back at, on another day of the week. Um, and it won't impact your claim. You can still file for that for the previous week. But um, there are days and times of the week where we see a surge in, in call volume. Okay. Thank you. Hi. So a week or so ago, you indicated the state might ask for less of the Moderna shots because it doesn't have as broad of a use among the population right now as the other ones do. Given though the news that Moderna is now going to be applying for emergency use in kids soon, does that change the state strategy in terms of which doses you will seek out in the future? You know, I, I would say it may, um, but uh, we do that on a week-to-week -week basis. So we have some time uh, before that uh, authorization actually happens uh, and then we'll reflect on that. It seems as though there's a lot of supply at this point in the system, uh, particularly for, for Moderna. So we can make those choices every single week as we, as we see fit. So if, um, if we see uh, there's emergency authorization, uh, we wouldn't want to stockpile uh, a whole lot uh, because it does have a shelf life. Uh, so we can't, uh, we can't keep it forever. So we just have to manage the supply. And then would you be able to outline how many extra doses you will be asking for from the federal pool this week and what kinds they are? I don't have that information. Um, I would assume that we'd be asking for more Johnson & Johnson uh, because we haven't received any uh, for a while. And that seems to be an area that um, we would be interested in. Uh, so that would just be me. Um, me guessing at this point. I, I'm looking at Dr. Levine and Secretary Smith, and neither of them have the uh, any more information than that. But our team will take a look and uh, address it. All right, thank you. Uh, Joe, the Barton Chronicle. Um, good afternoon. Uh, I'm curious, back, uh, going back to the correction system, um, Given that um, for a very long time, um, many of the facilities were in lockdown and noting the amount of stress that people who are not incarcerated have had uh, during this time, has, uh, do you feel confident that um, incarcerated people have been getting the kind of mental health treatment that they might need to cope with the uh, increased pressure of being imprisoned in, in prison. Yeah, I, I, you know, I have a lot of faith in uh, Commissioner Baker, um, but uh, maybe Secretary Smith can answer that. I'll turn also to uh, Commissioner Squirrel if she wants to add to any of this. We, we have been concerned about that and we have done some outreach in terms of making sure that there are mental health services uh, available uh, to those that may need it in our correctional facilities. We, Joe, we are cognizant of, uh, of you know, the, the con what has happened over the last uh, year in terms of uh, the, the men and women in our facilities, both that we care for and those that work in our facilities, to make sure that we do have that outreach. It, um, I know that Commissioner Baker has reached out to Commissioner Squirrel on numerous occasions in coordinating sort of the mental health aspects of it. Commissioner Squirrel, do you have anything to add? Uh, 
thank you for the question. Uh, yes, absolutely, the Department of Mental Health and the Department of Corrections work side by side to ensure that individuals who are in the correctional facilities have access to mental health treatment and supports. That includes assessment as well, um, given the ex extraordinary pressures that we have all been under. We also have a memorandum of understanding with the Department of Corrections that really facilitates um, collaboration, coordination, uh, clinical review of specific cases as appropriate. Um, it is certainly something that our teams work closely on together. Um, and again, as we move forward, um, we are also very much looking forward to implementing um, some of the opportunities in justice reinvestment um, so that as individuals are actually transitioning out of our correctional facilities back to the community, we're improving care coordination, mental health supports, and substance use services for those individuals. Thank you very much. Hi, Governor. I know that uh, we all know that uh, you and uh, Victory Smith and Dr. Levine have, have tried to lower the temperature, uh, temperature on consternation as far as mask wearing, et cetera, has gone during the whole pandemic. And I'm wondering if you have any advice for businesses, restaurants, uh, retailers going forward after you relax the uh, or get rid of the emergency order um, on, you know, some national retailers might still have mask mandates, some local retailers, et cetera, might. Um, and any advice to them to, you know, maybe some of them will want to have their employees wear masks or require masks for, um, it, but how, how do you see that playing out? You know, it'll be guidance at that point. And uh, I think the, whether it's the restaurants or lodging or any business for that matter, um, they have to take the temperature, so to speak, of their customers and their workforce and do what's best for them. I, I think, uh, you know, I have faith in, in their process as well, and they know their customers and employees better than we do. But we'll provide the guidance, and uh, they should do what they think is best uh, for all involved. And, it, you know, I've noticed in other places in the country there's still that, you know, consternation between in having those confrontations, and um, Vermont is, for the large, most extent, been able to uh, avoid that. So that's what I was wondering about. Yeah, I think um, the, we, the other thing I was wondering. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I, I think you know, for the most part, I think Vermonters and uh, Vermont businesses have done uh, extraordinarily well in trying to um, be cognizant that everyone has uh, their their many people have different views, and they are uh, very tolerant of that, and uh, making sure that they're protecting their employees and their customers uh, along the way. But I think for the most part, everyone's done uh, an amazing job. Uh, the other thing I was wondering is if perhaps Commissioner Harrington would have an update on what's happened or what's happening with the, the coffee cup Vermont bread situation, if anything, if there is any update, he knows of anything going on there. You mean in terms of um, those, uh, the employees who are affected? Well, yeah. Okay. Commissioner Harrington, anything new to report? Sure. Uh, thank you, Governor. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you, Governor. So. Uh, there were obviously about 250 uh, employees in total that were impacted. I think there were last minute, um, you know, last ditch efforts to try to sell the company and salvage the company in, the, in those positions. I'm not aware that any of those have gone through yet. Um, I think most people are aware it was reported um, in prior news stories about the fact that um, the company Coffee Cup uh, paid out uh, accrued leave and other benefits to impacted uh, employees, and then when the receiver uh, took over uh, the company and the, and the assets of the company, they actually clawed back uh, some of uh, those benefits that were paid out, like accrued leave, paid time off, so on, um, severance. Uh, so uh, I do know there is a, a pending uh, suit uh, that was filed, um, and the Department of Labor, in conjunction with the Attorney General's office, has uh, signed on as a friend of that suit in terms of uh, just generally supporting um, and the efforts of Coffee Cup to get their employees the money that they are owed. 
Um, you know, but that will uh, remain to be seen as, as that suit travels through the court system. So we continue to provide uh, uh, rapid response services, uh, unemployment insurance, uh, informational services uh, on how to file uh, for unemployment, and then also uh, reemployment services. Um, and I believe we've had a number of uh, impacted employees who have uh, been able to quickly find other employment. Uh, I was given... Uh, in a weekly report last week, a success, a success story where a, a maintenance employee of Coffee Cup uh, was uh, able to um, find reemployment relatively quickly with another uh, local employer. So um, I'm hearing more and more of those stories, which is which is always good news. Ben, I bet. Uh, thank you very much, Commissioner. Thank you, Governor. Thank you. Guy Page, Chronicle of the Vermont State House. Governor, New Hampshire Public Radio says the Diebold Bolt Tabulator machines in Wyndham, New Hampshire, operated by LHS, appear to have misread folds and mailed ballots as actual votes and somehow taking about 300 election day votes from each of the four Republican state representative candidates and adding 100 for one of the Democrats. Given that Vermont, too, uses LHS and Diebold machines, and last year, we used universal mail ballots for the first time. Uh, would you recommend that our Secretary of State investigate whether Vermont had similar problems? And if the Secretary of State chooses not to, is, is that something you'd be inclined to investigate through other avenues? Yeah, I, I had not heard uh, that piece of news from New Hampshire. Uh, I'm sure the Secretary of State has and uh, might be something you might want to ask him. Uh, obviously, we want to make sure the elections are secure. I think there was an audit done, um, which I believe it came out 100%. Um, um, so uh, I have no reason to believe that there was any any issues in Vermont, but uh, probably a better question for him at this point. Thank you. Yes, Governor, I got a message from a reader this morning wanting to know why the threshold for reopening is 80% with one dose when we're told that uh, everybody needs two doses and then two weeks after that to be fully vaccinated. Why wasn't that the threshold? Yeah, well, again, uh, t take, a, take a step back and see where we're at. We're, you know, we're one of the highest performing states in the country. Um, and many, many, many other states are fully open at this point. And so we, uh, we early on, had decided uh, what our threshold was going to be along the steps, the Vermont Forward Plan, uh, although we didn't identify the end. Um, so we decided to, I decided that uh, we needed a goal, and we decided uh, 80% uh, single dose, uh, at least commit to getting the, the vaccine, was appropriate, and that equates to uh, the 80% uh, will equate to just over 70%, which was part of step three. There was a, a range uh, of step three. I think it was 60 to 70%. So that gets us clear from that standpoint. Uh, I feel good about the uh, the prospects of us reaching that goal uh, within and and you know in advance of uh, what we had thought to begin with. Uh, so we should all uh, think that that's, uh, again, uh, uh, something to be proud of here in the state of Vermont. So I'm, um, I think uh, it's the, it was the right move uh, to make, although uh, admittedly uh, last weekend when we started to see the, the numbers uh, increase that I thought we might be able to have gone to 85%, but I'm, I think we 80% is a goal at this point. And afterwards, uh, again, I want to stress we're not going to stop there. Um, we're going to relax all the, the restrictions, uh, lift the emergency order just as soon as possible, uh, but we're still going to advocate uh, for those who have not been vaccinated to get vaccinated. Uh, we still have a ways to go in that regard, and we're still going to do our part. Okay, thank you.
Okay, uh, two, yeah, uh, this is that. I have uh, two questions. Um, the first one is, is I haven't seen the most recent update on guidelines, but for uh, youth who go to summer camps, are they going to be required to be vaccinated, or there, will they be treated any differently than uh, kids who have been vaccinated? We'll, we will be providing, I believe, an update on Friday um, or soon on summer camps, but I don't know if there's anyone on who can answer that question, Secretary Moore or maybe Dr. Levine. Uh, I'm happy to, Governor, this is Secretary Moore. Um, there, there is currently a, a summer camp guidance that also references the Vermont Forward Plan. So a bit of it depends on when we make that, that final step to stage four. Um, and But once we reach stage four, uh, summer camps will also operate under that same CDC and State of Vermont guidance. Okay. Um, my second question is, and this goes back to the issue of the uh, numbers that you discussed earlier. Um, when you're looking at the number of people who have been vaccinated with at least one shot, uh, originally it was only for Vermonters, but it expanded to include uh, college students who live out of state, uh, people who work in Vermont but, but live across the border. How do you account for that in your stats? Because you're comparing total number of vaccinated to the eligible population of Vermonters, and technically they're not Vermonters, so are they counted in there as if they're part of the general population? They, or they, do you separate yeah. them out so you can get to that number? Yeah, we do separate them out. It's just Vermonters that we count uh, towards the total population of Vermonters. That was an easy question, I guess, and an easy answer. Thank you very much. Thank you. Andrew, Caledonian Record. Uh, yes, thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, this is likely for Dr. Levine. Uh, it seems like we're all interested in counting how many people have been vaccinated today. Um, you spoke to this earlier in the conference, uh, and I'm wondering about the possible undercounting of uh, the vaccination rate in Essex County. Um, I received a lot of questions and comments from residents there who say a large number of residents work in New Hampshire, um, for instance, early priority groups like healthcare workers and teachers that were vaccinated at work or in pharmacies. How confident are you that, that those vaccinations are getting reported to you and, and are reflected in the, you know, in the dashboard that says Essex County is at 55% right now? So that's really two questions. One question is, how confident are we about the data that we get regarding Vermonters vaccinated out of state? And uh, we checked on this very early when we had the 1A group because we had a number of healthcare workers uh, and workers in other essential sectors that were being vaccinated out of state where they worked. Um, and that data does come back to the state of residence of the person. Just like uh, people who might come across the border to work in Vermont every day, but live in New Hampshire or, or New York State, uh, their numbers go to their states. So we're very comfortable and confident with that. The second question is, unfortunately we are comfortable with the 55 plus percent rate in Essex County being a real number. Um, I will add that that has gone up so the good news is it's not been a static number. It has gone up. It's just not at the level of the other counties at this point. But I don't think it's because of undercounting uh, Essex County residents who crossed the border to get their vaccine. Because even if that had a lag time, uh, by now we would have known the majority of those. It's not a very long lag time for that data to catch up. Okay, thank you very much. Mike Donahue, the Islander. Um, thank you, uh, Governor. One quick uh, thought as a follow up to Stuart and his trucking friends uh, might be uh, state set up vaccine shots when they're doing their truck inspections by DMV, 
along the interstate rest areas. Seems like that's pretty easy access for the truckers while they're stopped and uh, or even set up a specific shot clinic for truckers only, even without DMV, along maybe Interstate 89 in Colchester, that pull-off area and everything, but just a thought. Um, Dr. Levine, Dr. Levine, can you uh, please address the, the various deaths linked to uh, COVID-19 vaccine shots in Vermont? And will Vermont be adding those death statistics to the uh, state dashboard? I've checked and nobody recalls you disclo disclosing or discussing the Vermonters that have had reactions and have died from their shots that the CDC reports. So, so your question has to do with people who've gotten the vaccine as Vermonters and had died and the death was related to getting the vaccine. Correct. The CDC uh, website reports those by state and notice Vermont's numbers are up there, but we haven't heard too much talk about those deaths. Well, we get an advert, we, you know, we have the Vermont, the, the uh, vaccine adverse events reporting system, which allows us to look at deaths and serious reactions that could be potentially related to getting the vaccine. I'm aware of uh, only literally two serious events per vaccine platform that are reported within that system. I'm also aware of some deaths that were questioned whether they could have been related to the vaccine or not. Um, people who died within some time frame of the vaccine, not hours I'm talking, but usually weeks. Um, and then it's a challenge to figure out if that's a cause and effect issue or if there was another condition the person had that the vaccine was coincidence. So I'm not aware that we have a long list of people who have been linked to the vaccine in terms of death. Um, do you have a number you're dealing with? Uh, it's not my number, it's the CDC on their website has uh, eight Vermonters being dead because of the vaccine shot. Uh, that is, Clearly not the data that we have, uh, for sure. Uh, well, you may want to get your numbers updated. Uh, I mean, I assume the CDC will share who they they are. I mean, they've got four women dead and four men dead, if I read their website correctly. Yeah, let me let me look into that and come back with that on Friday because that's important if that's uh, truly what they're listing, but. We're pretty much in touch with the CDC all the time. And if there was something that was a real signal of an alarm like that, we would be aware. So let me get back to you on that. Because right now yeah. we don't, we I don't mean, that's have more, that. That's more than 3%, that's more than 3% of the deaths in Vermont. And I would think that, you know, I'm a little surprised you, you haven't mentioned that before. Even one or two, whatever. But, yeah. okay, uh, my other question today, Governor, uh, the state troopers and even some of the public are asking if there's any word on when the Department of Public Safety uh, will allow troopers to resume full public patrols and enforcement. Uh, it appears that they tell me that they're what is called, I guess, level two, which restricts responses to public complaints and limits their traffic stops on the Vermont roads. Um, and we've heard cases of troopers not assisting an officer on a stop on an interstate. Um, any idea the troopers want to know is to, are they waiting for the 80% or what, what's going to happen with the Department of Public Safety? Yeah, I'm not aware, uh, Mike. We haven't had that conversation, but uh, perhaps Commissioner Sherling could answer that. 
Yes, good afternoon, Governor. There aren't any uh, substantive restrictions on uh, on enforcement and other activity at this point. Uh, just we can take a, <clears throat> a little bit deeper dive, see if there's a miscommunication somewhere, but uh, we've been in a modified uh, level two for some time with very little uh, restriction. So what does modified level two mean as opposed to presumably level one means you're out there enforcing with no restriction? Uh, essentially following uh, our universal guidance uh, primarily. Um, there is a COVID manual that was developed early on, the first of its kind in the country that's been mirrored by uh, a number of agencies in order to protect both the public and staff. Uh, and that's what we're referring to rel relative to the levels for those uh, who are unfamiliar um, with that term. Uh, we anticipate that all of the, uh, uh, the entire COVID manual will go back on a shelf uh, in the not too distant future when we, when we reach 80%. So, okay, so the, the restrictions will continue at least conceivably for another week or until the 4th of July when those Yeah, I want to be really good. I would not refer to them as restrictions. Um, they are uh, compliance efforts to ensure that uh, our operations comply with the Vermont Forward Guidance. Well, semantics, it's sort of like your gag order that isn't a gag order. I think Rebecca just issued the gag order on Mike. <laughs> yeah, I'm passing along a question from a colleague. Um, she's working on a story about uh, kids going to summer school this year and the benefits of going versus not going. Um, just curious uh, from Governor Scott and then maybe uh, Secretary French and Commissioner Squirrel as well from a mental health standpoint. What would you tell a parent under these circumstances, uh, you know, the benefits of going to summer school versus um, not going? Oh, I, I, I think the, uh, the benefits of going to summer camp are tremendous. And I would, uh, I would advocate, uh, obviously it's their choice, their kids. Um, but from my standpoint, I would advocate for kids to go to, send their kids to summer camp. Uh, they've been really restricted in so many ways over the last, 14, 15 months, and uh, now we have an opportunity for them to get out and enjoy the summer. And I think that this is, uh, again, uh, unprecedented, uh, the level of, of programs that are available and the money that has uh, been put forth for summer programs. So uh, take advantage of that. Uh, maybe Commissioner Squirrel could uh, add to that. Yes, uh, thank you for that great question. Certainly, as I've articulated, the importance of connection and community and re-engagement are absolutely critical um, for our youngest children and adolescents to recover, to thrive, and also to be prepared uh, for re-entering school um, back in the fall. And for parents, I just wanna know, we've all had to readjust the pandemic. Um, and now our children and youth also have to readjust to a more normal cadence of social interactions with their peers. Every child and youth is different. Um, for some children and youth uh, who are more prone to anxiety, they may struggle with re-entry and re-engaging. This is all normal and to be expected. And parents should have those conversations with their children um, to support them with empathy and validation. Structure, routines, and rituals are so critical, which is why engagement in these summer programs and opportunities are so important. And to really encourage your children and youth to get back to those social interactions. And I would just remind us, we heard from the youth directly. This is what they want. They want to reconnect with their peers. They want to reconnect with their communities um, as part of their own path to recovery. Thanks for the question. And I did have just a very quick follow-up on that. Um, is there any, I don't know who this would best be for, um, is there any info on the uptake of these programs so far, people registering? And then I, I saw there was a need for some staff this summer. Um, is there any update on that? And is there still a need for people to, to step up this summer and help out? I, I would say yes, um, without really 
looking into it uh, any further than I have over the last couple of weeks. But uh, you know, the challenges in terms of uh, uh, staffing uh, throughout all sectors is uh, again challenging for all of us. So um, I would say yes, um, there's still a need, uh, but we'll, uh, why don't we uh, update some of that on Friday and uh, get you uh, some more information on where we stand. Sounds great, thank you all. Avery, WCAS. A recent survey found that the lack of, lack of time is one of the main reasons that people still aren't getting vaccinated even if they want to. And some states have even passed legislation requiring employers to provide leave for workers getting the vaccine. Is this something Vermont has seen as a barrier for this kind of last stretch of people who still need to get vaccinated to reach that 80% mark? I, I would say that, uh, you know, it's, it's probably going to be all the above in terms of what is keeping people from uh, being vaccinated. We heard uh, earlier, there was a uh, there was a truck driver that uh, didn't have a computer and wasn't aware. You know, it was a time factor uh, for him, uh, and looking for a walk-in clinic. So, um, I, I have to assume uh, that uh, that time is one factor for some who are working, and that's why we're trying to make it as easy as possible, uh, getting to some of the employers, getting to their work sites uh, and opening up more walk-in opportunities throughout the state. So uh, we have, a, again, a ways to go, but uh, we're going to continue to, to do everything we can to make it as easy as possible and be as accessible as possible. And uh, so that we have, uh, when you, you, know, you, you see an opportunity before you, that you'll take it and uh, get vaccinated. Anything, Secretary Smith, would you like to add to that? Yeah, in my opening mar remarks, I had mentioned the fact that in these uh, sort of pop-up clinics that we did over the weekend, many of the people that uh, had uh, gotten vaccinated said they they would not have gotten vaccinated had it not been for the pop-up clinic. So as the governor had mentioned, our sort of uniqueness and sort of bringing the clinics to uh, those Vermonters is, uh, is important, whether we do it at work sites, which I mentioned we have 27 that we're working on right now to bring to work sites, whether it's with the hospitality and tourism industry, which we, we've had one round, we're doing another round of uh, vaccination clinics with them, or it's this continuous uh, EMS um, effort that we're doing throughout the state and we'll continue to do uh, throughout the state, whether it's at Jazz Fest or these special events, or whether it's just a pop-up at our local rescue and EMS um, uh, facility. So I think it's important, and, and I really do think that our other states are starting to look at us um, as how we bring this to uh, rural communities uh, throughout the state and making sure that we make access uh, available for everyone. So yes, it does, but the, as the governor said, uh, convenience is one aspect of many, many reasons why people are 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 talking about that haven't gotten vaccinated yet. We're trying to eliminate every barrier there is right now. Thank you. That's it. Okay. Well, thank you very much for tuning in, and we'll see you again on Friday. Uh, uh.